before we start. We're talking today with Lee Stevens of Grand Rapids, Michigan, and the interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Okay, Lee, start us off with some background on yourself, and to begin with, uh, where and when were you born? Well, I was born in Manila, because my dad was stationed there, Manila, Philippine Islands, August 21st, 1930. All right. My dad was in the service, and uh, he was a Marine at once. At one time, he ran away from home, joined the Marines. <laughs> came back, went to college, then came back into the service. And my grandfather had a business in the Philippines, so he asked for assignment there to be near his dad. Okay. And did your father stay with the Marine Corps, or did he no. change branches? he went back into the Army okay. because there were some personal connections that we knew. And so anyway, he was in the Army when the war broke up. Well, the personal connections are kind of important. Who did you know over there? Well. My grandfather was a very close friend of General Douglas MacArthur. They were bridge rivalries. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he and his wife, and my grandfather and grandmother. And they played bridge a lot together, and we knew the family. Okay. Uh, and then did you have any particular connection to MacArthur yourself? No. Uh, I was never under his direct command. Well, Neither was my father under his direct command, mm -hmm. but we were, my father was under his overall command. Okay, but on a personal level, wasn't there a connection? A personal level, there's a family connection, yes. I thought General MacArthur was your godfather. Yes. <laughs> Not anything to be embarrassed by? No, except that it was not known when I was in service that that was the case. And when it was found out, it made a big difference. Mm -hmm. All right. But at the time being, when you were just, when you were a little kid, it didn't particularly no. matter. As a matter of fact, we didn't even think <laughs> about those things. All right. Now, what kind of, now did you grow up then in the Philippines? Yes, I grew up, um, my mother died when I was born, unfortunately. My dad married a Spanish lady. And uh, she put me in the Catholic schools because the Philippines was a Spanish country mm -hmm. and it was very Roman Catholicism was the main language, mm -hmm. a main religion. Right. And those things worked out all right. Okay. And now, after I got out of school. Describe the school that you went to a little bit because you were telling me about that before we started. Yes. In grade schools, boys and girls went together till second grade. Mm -hmm. After second grade, the schools were segregated. Boys went to one school, girls went to another. So I went to first and second grade with girls in a Catholic school. Then after we got out of that, my dad was interested in having me in to get a broad background. Because in the public schools in the Philippines, if your teacher was an American, you spoke English in the class, your teacher was a Spaniard, you spoke Spanish, and the teacher was a Filipino, you spoke Tagalog. So that was it. That's why I, I do have the three languages. Okay. All right. What proportion of the classes were in what language? Were they? Depends what the teacher was. Mm -hmm. Some, I'd say they were primarily in English and Tagalog more than Spanish. Okay. But your stepmother was Spanish, so the you get was some Spanish, of that too. And her whole family was Spanish. Right. Okay. Um, and now, before Pearl Harbor, you're, I guess you're about 10 years old or 11 when 11. Pearl Harbor. 11 when Pearl, okay. Before that, did you have any idea that there might be a war or anything no. else like that? Okay. We had no inclination. I'm not saying the adult population didn't know. I'm saying right, I, right. as a child, was not aware of that. Right. That's what I was asking. So, okay. So you were. So now, describe what happens when the war starts. What did you see, hear, or do? Well, the war started there on January 8th, compared to January 7th. December 8th. December 8th, yeah. excuse me, because of the International Day right. Pride. And it was 
one o'clock in the morning when my dad got a phone call <laughs> and well, whatever time it was and he said we are at war and he told us we were at war and that was it but that didn't even that didn't really hit an 11 year old we didn't know what war was okay how quickly did you start finding out well we started finding out as soon as the Japanese took over or not even before that because towards the end of December uh, the, the army was retreating to Bataan mm -hmm. and General MacArthur declared Manila an open city. He said all military personnel have been removed, all military bases have been closed. And an open city is supposed to be free from bombing because there are no troops there. Mm -hmm. But they bombed us anyway. Then I became aware of what, mm -hmm. what war was. All right. And then, uh, what, ha what do you remember about the Japanese coming into the city? They did not march in, at least I did not see any big parades march in, and they made no big issue of picking up the American civilians. They started with the adults, and I was allowed to stay with my, I call her my mother, mm -hmm. She became my mother when I was just one. Right. So she is my mother. Mm -hmm. She brought me up. Uh, I stayed with her till they picked up all of the adults. And I know they picked up my grandfather and I found out. They came in and said, you have two hours to pack anything you want to take. No big trunks, just suitcases. We're, you're going to internment camp. They did that my, with my paternal grandfather and my maternal grandfather and grandmother mm -hmm. and my aunt, maternal, my mother's si sister-in-law. Right. Her brother was Canadian and he was in the army also. They decided to put him in San Tomas. That's a university in Manila just like a university, lawns, sidewalks, buildings, mm -hmm. no dormitories that I knew of, so that was the problem that developed, and they were all put in there. They weren't interested in the kids for a while, and then after a while they decided 11 and 12 year olds were old enough to realize a few things, so they asked, that they took me my brother is my stepmother's boy, mm -hmm. and she's Spanish, so she said he was a Spaniard, and Spain was supposedly a neutral country mm -hmm. during World War II. I think Spanish history shows differently, but that's not the point. Mm -hmm. So we were, then after a while, we were allowed to go out to see her. She mm -hmm. would come and get me. And then when the troops surrendered in Bataan, and when they surrendered in the Corregidor and they did the death march, which is part of our history, they said they wanted us to see the cowardly Americans, guys who would surrender instead of fight to the end, which was what the Japanese were supposed to do. So they took us to let us see them walk by. My mother and one of her brothers and uncle went with me. We would stand there. And while they were marching by, we were just looking in. All of a sudden, I heard a whistle that my dad used to do when he'd call our dog and when he'd call my brother and I <laughs> if he wanted us. And I said, and the Japanese stopped the column. It was going around. But then. I don't know how many men that were there copied the whistle. That they started them up again. And we, my uncle said, whatever happens, don't say anything. If you see your dad, don't say anything. Don't do anything, just look. It went by, I did not see what happened, but 
My dad had taken off his captain's bars and wrapped them in some paper. And as he walked by us, he dropped it. So after he had gone by, I thought my mother would say, let's go. But my uncle said, no, let's wait. Let's see the whole thing through. And when we saw the rest of them go by, he bent down and picked it up and gave it to my mother. I wish I had those. <clears throat> I don't know where they are. Okay. Now, after that, what happened to you? Are you living in a kind of separate from your mother at this point now? I was put in with my grandfather. Mm -hmm. The women were put in the administration buildings and the classroom buildings with young children. Mm -hmm. Now, remember, these are, they are the bath facilities in these places are very scarce. Mm -hmm. There's no shower facilities in the classroom buildings. There's bathroom facilities. So it's very hard on the ladies. The men were put in the gymnasium, which was the only part of the campus that had a Japanese-built fence, because the church, the center of the mosque church, was right there, and the church was open to the general public, so they had a wired fence. And that's how I also saw my mother when I was in there. She would go to the church. She did send food in, which, which was allowed, but all the food was inspected and looked at, and there better not be any notes or anything that would upset the Japanese guards. OK. Then after a while, they were very confident that they were going to win the war. They were letting us out. Well, they would come and get us once in a while and stay. You know, it worked out all right till they got worried. <laughs> they started losing an island here and losing an island there. And then they started getting a little bit more. How did you spend your time day to day while you're in the camp? Well, you know, there were a lot of Americans. I th the death rate in the camp was quite high. I don't know the statistics. I think they're in that book called Son of Tomas that my grandfather wrote. Mm -hmm. And that uh, they're, they're in there. But I did not pay attention to that. Mm -hmm. you know, when you're 12, 13, you're not in. But there were quite a few deaths. And there were some deaths from illnesses and some from abuse. But they were, they claim we disobey their but I must say, we had to bow to the Japanese guards. And boys, our boys, and there was a gang of us, and said, no, we're not going to bow. Fortunately, we had some adults who had some sense in their head. And they said, look at it this way. They can make you bow because they have a rifle that has bullets in it, and they have a bayonet that they can stab you with. So they can make you physically bow, but they can't control your mind. And that still, I still remember that, mm -hmm. which was a good lesson. But I must say that most of the guards followed the Japanese custom. A private bows to a corporal, a corporal bows to a sergeant. But after the bow, the bow is returned. And most of the guards, when we walked by, we had to bow to them. They returned the bow. Now, since you were civilian internees, you're not combatants, so you hadn't been cowards in some sense. Does that help you in terms of how the Japanese treated you? Were you treated any better than the military prisoners? Oh, well, we were treated a lot better than the military prisoners. Unfortunately, my grandfather wrote a book on Santa Tomas, and there's a book called Of Mice and Men that was written about the camp in Kabanatuan that is mentioned in the book, Go Soldiers and the Moving the Long Raid. They were severely treated. The book showed pictures that the guys drew afterwards of the beatings, what they had to do. You had to hold your arms out and they hit you with a bamboo pole. If you dropped them, you got five more. Well, actually, you had to hold them up. But that mm -hmm. did not happen in our camp. 
slapping, or if you were hit and you went down, kicking, yes. As a matter of fact, go ahead a little bit, after we were liberated, there was an incident where the Japanese held the women's barracks and threatened to shoot all the women if they were attacked. But when they were allowed to march out, boys again, mm -hmm. we were all there and asking our American soldiers, make them bow to us. <laughs> they didn't make them bow to us, but anyway. All right. Now, did anyone try to escape while you were there? Three men escaped. And we had groups of 10 in each group. And they weren't all men and they weren't all women. They were mixed. And they weren't all young and all old. They were mixed. And if you were married, you might be in one group. Your wife might be in another and your teenage son in another, which discourages people from escaping because they're going to kill the whole mm -hmm. lot. Well, three guys escaped. They were caught, they were brought back, and a trial was held. I didn't see it. The committee, there's the prisoners were, the interns, I should say, were allowed to have a committee. That's also in the books, and their names are all listed. And they would report to the Japanese. They were told to tell us. When the three guys came back, they went, they dug their own graves. The committee was there to wit witness their shooting. And there's a Son of Tomas interns published annual had an annual meeting and they published stories that everybody wrote mm -hmm. so you could read. And there's a description by one of the men of how these guys were killed. Mm -hmm. They dug their own hole, they were made to sit on the edge of it, and they were shot in the back of the head. Then the committee was made to fill in the hole. We knew that. But we never saw any more of this other people in the group. Don't know what happened to them. So you don't know whether they were executed or just moved to a different camp? Or That's anything. right. Yeah. There were women in there, so we were hoping they were moved to a different camp. Mm -hmm. But we don't know. All right. Now, while you're in the internment camp, did you have much contact at all with the Filipino population in general? The Filipinos were allowed to come in to, to visit. Mm -hmm. so, were, so was my mother allowed to come in to visit my grandfather and me. And the men were allowed to build, we call them nipa huts, mm -hmm. shacks, right. away from the gym and take care. And only men could live in them. Men and women were segregated. Mm -hmm. Wives and husbands were separated, right. segregated. So were children. We were allowed to do that. And the Filipinos would come in, help us bring the lumber if we could pay for it, mm -hmm. so forth. They, uh, my grandfather built one, and we got to stay in it. Mm -hmm. There's no water, of course, or anything. You had to go and get your food and everything, but we were allowed to do that. And if you had a typhoon, it wasn't a nice place to be. <laughs> and we did have typhoons regularly. The food was primarily prepared, but you, they could bring it in. They had a, at the gate, they had a table which was filled, um, ser serviced by prisoners, mm -hmm. and you would bring a gift of food and it would have your name, a person's name on it, and they would deliver it to them. But that was all opened and searched to be sure mm -hmm. there were no notes and no, nothing that derogatory, and the Japanese guards looked over it. And if they saw something they liked, they took it. Mm -hmm. And that's the same thing. I did not know at the time, but reading history, I found out that international law says that when you have civilian prison interns, you're supposed to give so much money a day to feed them. Mm -hmm. They did. And they would buy it. And we, 
and some people were allowed to go out under guard supervision to buy this stuff. Mm -hmm. But when they brought it back and they cooked it, the best example is, you, you know, you buy a fish whole. Mm -hmm. They would cut off the tail and the head and skin. They would take half of the bodies mm -hmm. of the fish and leave the tails, and, which was the first. It, it still is insulting, mm -hmm. but the cooks or dietitians or whatever was in charge of the would cook the the rice got less and less and it got soupier and soupier. Then they started putting the fish heads and tails and cooking it with it. Mm -hmm. Then removing them as much as possible. At least you got the nutrients right. of the food. And it was food was scarce. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the favorite things was canned foods that but they there was no canning factory in the Philippines. So that eventually ran out. And did you ever get Red Cross stuff? Oh yes, I can come to that. But there was also <laughs> I've talked to kids in school, and this thing upset the girls more than it did the boys. <laughs> they rationed toilet paper. You were allowed four sheets a day. When I mentioned that to the girls, you can imagine what they thought. Mm -hmm. Well, you can imagine what the ladies there thought, too. Mm -hmm. So most of us guys would give it to you. We'd use newspaper mm -hmm. and stuff. We tried to do the best we could to help the ladies out. And I forgot your question. I asked about Red Cross packages. We had Red Cross packages, <clears throat> and they were given. One time they gave it out, and I didn't smoke at the time. I smoked when I was in college, and I haven't smoked since. But they gave it out, and they had cigarettes from Old Gold. I don't know if you remember that brand. And they had a poem, Our Heritage Has Always Been Freedom, and it goes on in that. They gave it to us, and we got it, and we were passing it around. Never mind the cigarettes. Look. The Japanese found out that they were there. They took all our Red Cross stuff away. Mm -hmm. That was the last we saw of Red Cross. All right. Now you mentioned, now did you get sick yourself or did you stay healthy? Uh, yes, I got a form of dysentery during the war. But it's cured. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it wasn't cured at the end, but took care of it. Coming back on the ship after the war, it was a, one of the luxury ships that was used as a transport. Right. The doctors on there took very good, made sure we, mm -hmm. all of us were treated and taken care of. I think there were more doctors on the ship. Oh, and there were also doctors in the prison camp, mm -hmm. but they had been without, not, so it was a comedy. The ship gained, I gained a lot of weight coming back on the ship, okay. <laughs> But the doctors in the camp didn't have anything to work with. Very little. And if we got, sometimes the Red Cross packages had medications. Mm -hmm. They were allowed to keep that unless the Japanese needed it. But on the whole, there weren't the things that, they weren't the things that cured the disease, right. Mal malaria and stuff like that, no. So did you get malaria? Or? No, I did not. Thank you very much. I did not. Well, but a lot of them, did, a lot of my fellow interns, the adults did. Okay. Now you mentioned that as the war went on and things went badly for the Japanese, the conduct of the guards and so forth started to change and events changed. So what happens as the war moves on? Well, it's like any army. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know what the Japanese command system was like. If they had a company that was assigned or a battalion that was assigned to guard us in terms of our army, but the whole unit was transferred and sent back to the front and another unit took over, and it all depended on the commanding officer and the treatment that you got. And the guards could slap you if they wanted to. But they also 
when you bowed to them. Like I said, mm -hmm. most of them bowed back. They loved playing baseball. And we had, some of us had baseball gloves and stuff. And the men barred up and some of our older men played against them. We, to my knowledge, <laughs> we never beat them. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if we could have or, <laughs> but we didn't want to take any chances. Right. But most of them, like I said, you bowed to the guard, mm -hmm. he bowed back to you. If he didn't, you didn't say anything, you just stood up and walked mm -hmm. away. You may say something under your breath, but you didn't say anything. Okay. Now, did you stay at San Tomas through the entire war? At least until the Americans well, that's got there. A, yes, but you remember, I was only 11 when mm -hmm. I went in, and I was allowed to go stay with my mother right. every once in a while, and then brought mm -hmm. back. But towards the end of the war, it got to be there all the time. Mm -hmm. Oh, excuse me. I was allowed to stay with my mother for a longer period of time. They arrested my grandfather, and he wrote in one of the chapters in the book, Simon Tomas, that uh, he was taken to a special where the Japanese intelligence had it, and they tortured him, hung him on a pole, pulled out his toenails because they thought he was a spy because he was president of the American Red Cross local institution. Well, then there was nobody for me to be with. They allowed me to be with my mother. Mm -hmm. Then they came back in. Okay, so what, did your grandfather come back into the camp then eventually? Yes, he was released from San Tomas, they said, okay, you're not a spy, you can go back. Go back to San Tomas, and they set, put him out in the camp. He was barefooted in shorts because they took all these things away, and he was supposed to walk back three miles to the camp across a bridge, and he, which was guarded by mm -hmm. Japanese soldiers. And very fortunately, one of the Filipinos who had a Karamata, that's a horse-drawn buggy that they rent, you know, like a taxi. And they saw him and saw, could tell he was an American, so this guy took him to the camp mm -hmm. and dropped him off. That was a God bless him. Right. All right. Now, did you ever get to see your father again? Yes. Uh, if you know the story of Kabir Tuan, the, the long raid, mm -hmm. or Go Soldiers, they were liberated on January 31st. My dad was sent to Manila to go to Japan on January 27th. So he was there for a few days. One of the guards came to the prison camp, talked to my grandfather. My grandfather contacted my mother through the Filipinos who worked there, which they always, or most of them were very congenial to Americans. And the guy says that he would have my father in a certain window of Bilibid, that's the name of the prison, the actual, it was actual prison right. for criminals, and have him at a certain window. If I wanted, my mother could see him and my mother got permission to take me so we could see him. Mm -hmm. And then three days later, well, it was a little bit longer than that. Anyway, he was put on a ship and sent to Japan. It no sooner got out of Manila Bay than it was torpedoed by our troops. Mm -hmm. No, excuse me. I don't know if torpedoed or bombed bombed by our troops anyway. The guys, many of them lost their lives, but many of them were able to swim to shore. He was recaptured, and he was put on the uh, hell ship that they called the Rokomuru. And that was where they were put in a hole, the loading holes all standing up, no chance to sit down. Food was dropped down on top of them and distributed. 
that we found out from the survivors. And of course the guys in the very corner of the room didn't get anything. Mm -hmm. But that, that ship, ship was sunk too. Mm -hmm. And my dad went down with that ship. At least he was never found. Right. Now when did you actually learn that? Was it after the war? Or? Yes, I learned it after the war. After the war, my grandfather brought me back. My mother kept her boy there because he wanted me to go and he put me in military school. I was in military school. Then when I got a letter from my mother telling me she had married again, mm -hmm. then I knew my dad had died. I didn't, I was not told, I did not know. All right, uh, now we'll kind of, so we get back into the latter part of the war, I mean, the Americans land at Leyte in the Philippines in October of 44. Uh, they'll land on, on Luzon, I think, in, in January. Uh, so they're, and they'll come into Manila not too long after your father was sent out. Their Americans are already going in. Yeah. Uh, what happens, what do you observe there in those last months of the war? Uh, my dad was sent to Japan. Yeah. It was February the 3rd, 1945. We had already had the normal roll call check for the night. We were allowed back. We, you, they didn't care if you got, went out, but just stay so they could, the guards could see where all of their responsibilities are. We heard shooting at the front gate. And we were all scared because we had heard stories that they were killing Americans rather than let them be safe. And then all of a sudden, several tanks came in and soldiers we didn't recognize. But when we saw that blasted white star on those tanks, we knew. Holy hell broke us. <laughs> Everybody was happy and screaming and yelling. But the Japanese went into the one administrative building that was loaded with mothers and little children. Mm -hmm. They put them all up on the second floor and threatened to kill all of them if the Jap if we attacked the uh, our troops attacked mm -hmm. them. Of course we didn't attack them. They, they were surrounded. Mm -hmm. There was negotiations and they were allowed to walk out. Mm -hmm. They were allowed to walk out with their weapons, but not, they had to carry them over their shoulder, mm -hmm. muzzle down, right. bolts open. So they were last, that's when we tried to get our guys to make them bomb mm -hmm. to us. But they didn't, they were allowed out, and the guys were safe. You know, it brings back another memory that says the Japanese called our troops coward because they surrendered. What is more cowardly than to hide behind a woman and a child? Mm -hmm. In my opinion, they were more cowards than we were. I hope if any Japanese see this, they don't take it personally. Most likely not at this point. Uh, but probably hey, not. Yeah. It's still a feeling I have. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I'm not saying. Oh, and after that, we're liberated. And by the way, I get teased when I was in service. When I was in service, I got teased a lot by some of my fellow trainees first, and then even some of the officers, uh, because I like spam. And a GI does not like spam. Mm -hmm. But when the 1st Cavalry came in, they, of course, surrounded the camp so that we wouldn't be attacked. They put up a field kitchen. And the first meal they served us was fried spam, mm -hmm. dehydrated potatoes, which were not powder, but they were little cubes that they made, and a can of peas. 
gentlemen, that is a Thanksgiving dinner. Mm -hmm. Still is. Uh, compared to what you had for, for the past years, four years? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now, did they let you uh, go out right away and stay with your mother, or did you have to stay in the camp? They, Manila is divided by a river down the middle, Pasig River. We were on one side with the camp, and they ended up on the other side. Once this side was free, and we could go if you had your home on that side. My grandfather's home was on the other side, so we stayed in camp. But my mother came and got us. She came and got us before it was completely free. Mm -hmm. There was still, because I remember we, got, we were coming home. Now, I don't remember exactly if we were already home or anything else, but she was walking in front of me. And she was, I was short then, I'm not as, was not as tall as I am now. I was a little taller than she was. And there was gunfire, and she got hit in the shoulder. And if she had not been in front of me, that bullet would have hit me in the chest. Mm -hmm. But her brother was a doctor, and her brother took care of it and checked me over. All right. Now, um, when did you then leave the Philippines? I left the Philippines on August 27th, to, uh, 1945. Mm -hmm. I turned 15 August 21st. We were on a troop ship coming back, and we the war was over. The war ended the 14th. But because of the story of the Indianapolis got out, they were still in convoy. Mm -hmm. We went down the convoy till we got almost close to Hawaii, and the convoy broke off. And it was a luxury liner, there were several of them, mm -hmm. things. And they were very good to us. They fed us well. The boys were allowed to go down with the troops, mm -hmm. the girls and the families all had the upper deck. Right. We went down and we were down with the troops and we, we literally got spoiled. Here were guys who'd been away three years, four years or whatever it was, and had no American kids. All of a sudden they got American kids. Mm -hmm. But they were also some school teachers in the lot. Oh. <laughs> and they made sure we had schooling every day. But, and, and during camp, too. I'm not going to say that we didn't have, we had chores to do, but they also had teachers there, and they did, and there were a lot of missionaries who were mm -hmm. teachers, and there, they did have classes and tried to keep us up as much as possible. Right. We didn't have the books, but, oh, yes, they let us have some books, but, if this is a book, they would, and it's all about the American history, mm -hmm. they would cover it mm -hmm. so you could look at it. And if you, they found out that cover was ripped, you were in trouble. Right. They didn't want you to read about your history. But yes, we did have those books. Math books, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Okay. Now, are there other uh, things that happened in the Philippines before you left that you've kind of got your notes that you haven't brought into the story yet? No. No. Actually, yeah, we after the Manila was completely freed, mm -hmm. there were no more there were five bridges in Manila. They were all now pontoon bridges. And my cousins were not really my my step cousins. Right. We'd walk over to the other side for the cleanup because that's the side that took the last part. And uh, they, uh, we saw some Japanese, I hate to admit, we, my cousin and I kicked the corpse. That was not very nice to do, but at that time we were still. Mm -hmm. And they, those are about the things. We went to see the old walled city of Manila 
they have the wall city walls were probably the width of this building mm -hmm. filled with dirt and tall and that was the old Spanish city of Manila and they had the Japanese concentrated themselves in there and we had to go we went in there because our school was in there mm -hmm. and there's nothing left of the place I will admit that I think our American we saw them dive bomb and bomb and so forth but when we went in there were three churches the three churches were still standing mm -hmm. so our guys must have known where those churches were right. and bombed around them mm -hmm. that made an impression sure. okay now go back to your story so you're on the boat they're curing you of dysentery you're getting back to the states now where do you land in the US we landed in San Francisco my grandfather, we got a hotel. My grandfather took and made arrangements with some people he knew. And then I was placed in a military school. And where was that? San Rafael, California. Okay. The military school no longer exists. Mm -hmm. But I was placed there with intention because my dad got a silver star. I was entitled as an officer's son to try for West Point if I wanted, and my grandfather wanted it, and so did a certain other person want it. <laughs> and so I was put in military school. And then after that, one summer my grandfather said, well, I'm going to put you with a cousin this summer because I don't know, I'm going back to Manila. Mm -hmm. He put me with a cousin in Michigan in Petwater, a little town up north, mm -hmm. and I met my grandmother, my grandfather's cousin. I started calling her grandmother Pearl because her grandsons were there, and I was the same age, mm -hmm. so she's the one who finished the education and watched me go through college. Okay. Now, so did you apply to West Point, or did you skip that? No. I thought about it. And I said, no, I know why I was in military school. But, but, but when I was in service, when my, I think I mentioned when my daughter was born, I was called to the commander's office. It made me think, after that, every time I went to the officer's club, uh, sir, here's your table. It wasn't with, it was up where the higher ranks captains and stuff were not. So I said, I know why this is happening, mm -hmm. and I don't want this. If I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it on my own, so I quit. I resigned. All right. So let's back up then a little bit. So you go to military school. So when do you graduate from that? Graduated from that in 49, and then came, went to school in, at Western Michigan okay. in Kalamazoo. And what did you study there? Studied education. Okay, and then uh, what did you do when you finished that? I went to service. <laughs> okay, so how did you wind up going to the service? I was drafted. Mm -hmm. It's a co coincidence in that I was drafted. I reported. The draft board asked me all the questions. Mm -hmm. They said you were in concentration camp for that. I said yes. So well, you've seen enough war. You're excused. Mm -hmm. So I went home. Back, I was planning to go back and work for graduate work. Mm -hmm. Next week, I got another letter, report to the draft board. I reported the local. I said, I thought you told me I was excused. The local draft board said, Yes, you're excused, but the state says you're not excused, so you're drafted. Mm -hmm. So I went in. All right. And then, how old were you when you went in? 23. Okay. All right. And uh, where did they send you for basic training? I went to. Uh, Fort in, Can in Arkansas, Fort Chaffee. Okay. It was Camp Chaffee when I was there, right. it's now Fort Chaffee. All right. Then I was transferred to Counterintelligence School in Baltimore, Maryland. Okay. Well, let's start with the basic training. Uh, what was that like? Normal basic training. I will admit, we passed room inspection every time. 
the first week there, they said, okay, after we got rid of our white tags, three or four weeks, because all recruits had white tags on their uniform to let everybody know they were raw. And then they said, after that, you could have a leave, but you have to have your barracks spick and span, and it will be inspected by a master. Well, you know, I'm an army prat, or a marine prat, whatever you want to call me, and my dad made me pass inspection. Mm -hmm. So I know what to look for. I told him above the ledges of the door, take off the heating vents, clean the inside of the heating vents, be sure you get in the springs of your bed and get all the dust out between that. And when the sergeant got done inspected, he said, one of you is, a, is an army brat, and he walked out to pass <laughs> inspection. And that was, then I was, then with us, after that, went down and got now, training now, and OCS. You know, when, because you had been to a military school and you were an army brat before that, so was, was training pretty easy for you? Or was it physically I knew what to expect. Mm -hmm. I knew what to expect, yes. They, and of course I was only 18, no, I was 23 yeah. when I went in the Army. Yeah. I was a little bit older. So you were, were but you, I was the oldest one in the whole outfit. Right. <clears throat> and did you get treated differently or get given extra responsibility because of that or because you knew what you were doing? Oh, yes. I got the, the trainee uh, company commander. Mm -hmm. uh, not company, yeah, company. Yeah, they have company, yeah. Yeah, you know, I was, it's like assistant to the master sergeant because of my training. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> I made a mistake. Uh, he really, he was good. The, you clean up the parade grounds, you line up and you pick up all the cigarettes mm -hmm. that everybody drops. I got through and I didn't have any. And he brought the jug around, everybody put this. I didn't have any. He said, step back. The other guys didn't have it. There's about six or seven that didn't have any. And he said, what's the matter? You guys blind? He said, no, you six guys go back to the parade ground on your knees and find me. And then when he saw me later, said, you know better than that. Mm -hmm. I had to admit I, I chuckled. Mm -hmm. I had it coming. I knew. Now, by the time you go in, it's 1954, right? Uh, so that's after the Korean War, has, there's an armistice in place by then. Yeah, I didn't get out until 56. Right. You went in 54, so you go in, and so the shooting part of the war, that war at least, was over by the it's time over. you went in. Yeah. But was there an expectation you would still get sent to Korea? Or? Yes, there was an expectation. That, but I was first assigned to the 82nd Airborne Division. Okay, and this is another reason why I'm not in the Army. Mm -hmm. My wife got pregnant, mm -hmm. went to the Army base. My grandfather found out about it. Next thing I know, I'm transferred to 3rd Army Headquarters. Now, <laughs> no comment. <laughs> now, where was the 3rd Army Headquarters? Atlanta, Georgia, Fort McPherson. Okay. All right, so you've gone there. Now, um, before At least you there, I got, a, got rid of my uniform, got civilian clothes to wear. Okay. Now, was that when you got assigned to intelligence, or had you done No, that? I was already in intelligence. Okay. So did you take intelligence training someplace? Yes, Fort Hollenburg, Baltimore, Maryland. Okay, talk a little bit about that. What were you doing there? Half of it was, half of it was how to keep documents and things secret from the enemy. Mm -hmm. How don't, you know, the see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. There's a see all evil, see, speak, listen to all evil, and report all evil. No, it was, it was different training. You learned, other than a rifle, or the normal training things, 
we learned all of the handguns. Now what kind of jobs might you go to from that training? Well, our job was counterintelligence is to be sure that the people who get to handle secret and top secret information are loyal citizens. Mm -hmm. We would do the investigating work. <clears throat> we would do the investigating work if anyone was considered a spy or probably had questions of his loyalty. That was our job. That was not the military police. But that was dealing with secret documents because not every soldier is quite cleared to look at secret documents. Was there a process for you to get clearance? What did you have to do for that? Oh yes, I had to get clearance. I was called into, when I was in, at Fort Hollenberg, I was called into the training commandant's office, not the, not the commandant mm -hmm. of the base. And he asked me if I knew a certain person. I said, yes. He's married to my cousin. He said, how well do you know him? What this and that, what this and that. And I said, I don't know him very well, other than he's married to my cousin. I never met him till I met my cousin, and so forth, and so forth. Then, okay, you're excused. I didn't know what it was all about. And then I found out later, after I was done with my training, that he had been a postmaster Town, small town that he lived, and he had scounded some of the funds of the post office. So that put a question mark on my record. Right. But I'm sure other people helped eliminate that question mark, which is another reason why I didn't want to stay in the service. All right. So the now MacArthur himself was sort of removed from command in Korea in the middle of the war and yes. essentially disgraced, but he was still someone who had influence and connections yes. within the Army at that point? He made his famous speech at West Point, the Army, the Army, the Army, you know. You know. Old soldiers never die. Uh, yes, all of that stuff. Yes, he was still, wore his uniform, mm -hmm. he still had his privileges. I cannot say that President Truman was wrong from the military training that I had from my dad and from the general, one of my things. You don't question a superior officer and you don't make him wait two hours in a plane before you get to see him mm -hmm. unless you have a darn good reason. That's just a breach of protocol. Mm -hmm. And he did that. And I can say that I think President Truman was wrong in that. Maybe a little more drastic than I might have done it, but... Okay. Well, there was a lot of backstory to that. Yes, it had that, nothing to do with you. Yes, that was nothing to do with me, but right. personal opinion of a junior officer, mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Now, when you go into the intelligence, I mean, how was being in that intelligence service different from being an ordinary GI? You were looked on... You know, in the police department, they have a department that investigates the officers mm -hmm. who they, right. you're looked upon that way. That you're here because I did something wrong and you're gonna find out about it and take care of me. That's how we're looked upon. Okay. Now, officers and enlisted, junior officers and enlisted men look on it the same way. Mm -hmm. All right, so, I don't know, I mean, who? Were there people you reported to who were high enough up they weren't worried about you that way? I mean, how does... I made every effort not to let them know any of my connections. Mm -hmm. And the ones who broke it were my grandfather. Mm -hmm. He wanted to know, because I did not call him and tell him when his first great-granddaughter was born. Mm -hmm. <laughs> my fault. And uh, then he knew the base commander, mm -hmm. general. They were friends. The general knew, I knew General MacArthur. Mm -hmm. 
and that got out. You know, it's just like saying, General Patton's son goes to school, he's going to get through. Mm -hmm. General MacArthur's son goes to school. I don't know if David ever did go to school, go to West Point. He would get to school, they would make sure he did. It's chain of command. <laughs> many, of the, many of our general's parents were all. Yeah. But you weren't really interested in that side of things at all. I was. Yeah. I was. But when it started, when I wasn't doing it, I knew I got transferred after a while. I knew I got transferred to Atlanta mm -hmm. because Grandpa was concerned that the, the, the division hospital isn't the same as a, a general headquarters of Third yeah. Army Hospital. Okay. So he was thinking about where his great grandson was going to get born. Or, yeah, but never, he never got a grandson. I have four girls. Mm, oh, well. Right. So, how long did you wind up staying in the Army? Just those three years. Okay. All right. Uh, and by the t when you finished, the, then what did you do? Oh, I went back, went back to school, got a master's degree, worked toward a doctorate. After a while, I was ready. I was ready to take my exams, and I was offered a position up in, up north, near a ski area where I'd love to ski, mm -hmm. and uh, the, where they let you, if you were a principal, take your kids skiing, and they could ski mm -hmm. and you could ski free, okay. So I took the job, it was a good job. I enjoyed it, the kids had a good time, and I did not, the, I was not a principal at the school where my children were. Mm -hmm. I would not, that was not to be. Okay. All right, and how long did you, did you stay a principal or become a superintendent or what did you do in the long run? Oh, I became a curriculum director mm -hmm. and you lose contact with the kids. I helped out one time the superintendent resigned and they needed somebody to do the job in the meantime so they appointed me. I did not apply for the job. I wanted to get back with the kids. Mm -hmm. So I took a job as a principal, stayed as a principal. Okay. Had them for years. All right. Now you've got normally when I kind of get going to close out an interview with, with a veteran, I ask a fairly basic question about how they think their time in, in the service affected them. But your own life as it relates to things military and wars is sort of more complicated than that. So I guess to go back to the experience that you had in the Philippines, how do you think that shaped you or how did that affect you? That make, made me feel that I could fit in with the military very well. Mm -hmm. I still, see? I have this from Diane Vets. Mm -hmm. They asked me to, they came here and honored me and asked me to speak. Besides that, I did. It's a time when there was a poem written about when you see a soldier in uniform, thank him because of that. And I got up with all of these veterans and I said, I read the poem and I said, I'm reading this poem for a very specific reason. I never said thank you to the guys who came in and saved me. Mm -hmm. And after they had, we were liberated and we were still in camp, because the Japanese shelled us. And two of the guys who were in the squad that was assigned to guard the, the gym mm -hmm where I was in, were killed in the shelling. There were 12 soldiers and 19 civilians who were killed in the shelling. And I never got to thank them. And one morning we got up, and the guys who came in to get us out were new. I said, well, where's so-and-so? He said, the first cavalry has been transferred in. We're the occupational forces. Right. I never got to say thank you. I lost two guys were close. 
like I said, there are a lot of guys my age, and the soldiers, mm -hmm. they babied us. Yep. We got all their candy bars, but not their cigarettes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this was, that was the case, but anyway. So, things worked out. And do you think you kind of learned anything or what? And since then, I have never met a person from the 1st Cavalry Division who was assigned in that campaign in the Philippines. I hope before I go, I can thank one guy. Now, as sort of an anti-climax, do you think you yep. took anything out of your actual time in the service yourself? Did you gain from that or learn from that? Or I think I'm a better man for being in service. Okay. I encourage my young people in school to be in service. I used to challenge them in physical education to keep exercising. One young man, I came in, I asked the gym teacher, how many push-ups can this boy do? These boys do, and the voice from the back of the room says, probably more than you can. I said, all right, if you're man enough to come forward and admit you said that, I guarantee you, you will not be punished. He came up, challenged, came up. Mm -hmm. I said, so you think you can do more than I can? I took off my jacket and loosened my tie, stuck it in under my shirt like the military do. I said, come on, let's go. When he stopped, I did five more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> then I got up and told the teacher, now, at the end of the semester, if he can't do one more than I just did, flunk him. <laughs> <laughs> then I told the teacher to say, don't you dare flunk him. <laughs> but so, yes, it carried down. I ran against him, President. Um, Reagan had the presidential physical fitness program for youngsters. They had to run two miles. I ran two miles against my gym classes, made them do it. 